in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to begin reading at verse 11, even though I pointed out that we would start at 13. Hebrews chapter 11, no, verse 11 of chapter 6 says, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he, Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Where in God, oh yes, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we may have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope? we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I want you to look at somebody like you're angry with them and say, I still expect my promise. Look at somebody like you're mad with them on the other side and said, it's got to come to pass. It's got to come. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. After listening to all of the marvelous hymns that we heard today. I am now at the age where I take a seat and I do a little lecturing. You know, after a while, I look back at the days when I was crawling and, uh, and I said to myself, oh my God, who is that person? But as life goes on, we evolve. And very definitely, I am passing out of this generation. There's a time when all of us were optimum within the parameters of the generation that God placed us in. And then as time goes on, we become less connected to the contemporary environment that we used to be so significant in. You know, you move from the baby boomers to the X's and now you've got millennials and Z's. And the only thing that really keeps us, everything has, every, everything has an expiration date. But the only thing that keeps us connected is dealing with these young men and young women who are connected to the contemporary environment that we are passing out of. And so as mentors, we listen to the mentees and we begin to extend our shelf life because now we get a better understanding of what's going on in a contemporary environment that we are passing out of. So the mentor is being mentored by the mentee as it relates to the contemporary environment that we no longer are connected to. 
See, what they did a while ago was they took us back to the hymns. See, it used to be somebody hymned it, then somebody gospeled it, then somebody rapped it. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And as we, well, I got a young wife, so I'm connected, but anyhow. <clears throat> So what happened today was they began to sing the hymns. And the hymns threw me so far back that it took me out of the lecturing chair. And it says, maybe, Reverend, you've met a hoop today. <laughs> so I don't know what will happen, but... When you look at the Hebrew church, there is something significant about them because the writer's writing to a group of churches and it's what they called a circular letter. And what's going on in the Hebrew church is that Judaism and Christianity was clashing. And it was clashing very uh, poignantly among the, the Hebrew Christians because being a Jew is not only related to their nationality, but it's also a part of their religious belief and the religion and the political aspects of their lives were intertwined so completely and so totally that if you were to move from the religion, you were literally moving from the very place of your ethnicity and racial foundation. So they were having difficulties because now they are following the carpenter's son from Nazareth and uh, nobody is actually acknowledging except those that are Christians that he is the Messiah. If you check even in our contemporary world, you will find that the Jews as a whole, the Jewish people as a whole, don't believe that Jesus is or was the Messiah. So give some consideration then to those who had initially began to follow Christ and when you initially do something that is opposed to everybody around, you have a proclivity or a pension to want him to respond quickly to show you that you are right. I don't know if you've ever had a vision and God has shown you and given you certain direction and before it came to pass, you articulated it and others around you thought that you had lost your mind because they evaluated your circumstances or your situation and they concluded that based on what they are looking at. We cannot understand how you could even think that you could overcome what we're looking at for what it is that you declare God is going to do for you. I think in many instances, we want God to instantly show our critics that what I am telling you he's going to do, he's going to do it. But the problem comes when he doesn't do it right away. So now you have to deal with the, yeah, the naysayers and all of those who have an opinion about where you're going and what you're going to end up with simply because they can't see it. Well, they're not supposed to see it. And really, for the most part, I don't think we should be upset. Uh, with people who doubt what God is saying. Because if the promise was so magnanimous, even when he gave it to you, you had to... Mm -hmm. 
you had to figure it out yourself. So if he gave it to you and you had a little difficulty getting up to it, then understand that the neighbor who didn't hear from God is going to have a little trouble getting it. So don't you let that discourage you, but use it as a stimuli, or a stimulus rather, to realize that it's really God. Yeah, yeah. Can I just say this? And uh, I might have to, you know, we might have church after a while. Uh, if you have no haters, you're not that gifted. It is significant then that the battle is, is constant because those who should know tend to struggle against falsity particularly when they had previous traditional associations that are always beckoning. As you walk with God, you will find that the world is always beckoning. The flesh is always pulling on you and the devil is always seeking you out. But add to that the fact that sometimes God is moving you beyond your tradition. And because of that relationship with tradition, you have to many times fight the people who are closest to you in order to move away from what they have decided is the norm for the way your life should go. So you're not only fighting the outside forces, you're fighting the inside forces. Because many people have decided that this is the way your life should go because everybody else's life is going this way. And you have to decide that the battle is not only for those on the outside, but I've got to deal with those on the inside. And so because he did not come as quickly as they wanted him to come, God now has to move in a way that he motivates those of us who follow him. It is an interesting thing that oftentimes he gives us and he strengthens us, yeah, yes, with groanings that cannot be uttered. That God begins to move into your spirit. Uh, can, I, can I take a little deeper? Uh, you see, the relationship with God, my relationship with God is not sensual. My sensual perception does not connect me to anything that is spiritual. And my eyes, my nose, my mouth, my ears, my hands connect me to my world, but they don't connect me to God. Because of that, Jesus is never recognized. He's always revealed. Oh yes, and many times we look at people and we say, well, he or she is anointed. You cannot assess anointing cognitively or intellectually because anointing has to be revealed. And when God has revealed something to you, you cannot allow yourself to talk your way out of it because you don't see it. Because it's not about seeing it, it's about it being revealed. Uh, can I go deeper before I go high? Uh, there were two boys in their mother's womb. They were separated by two thin layers of cutaneous tissue. When the mothers came together, uh, one was Mary, the other was Elizabeth, and there were two boys in their mother's womb. Now, in their mother's womb, Jesus was not reading the Jerusalem Tribune in his mother's womb. He is totally unconscious in his mother's womb. They're connected umbilically, but there is no intellectual, cognitive, Aristotelian reasoning while he is in his mother's womb. The Bible said when the two mothers came together that the child John, who is unconscious in his mother's womb, 
The Bible said that the child leapt in his mother's womb. John had a revelation of Jesus while he was unconscious in his mother's womb. Now, a few years later, the conscious John sent word to Jesus to ask, are you the one or should we look for another? Now, the unconscious John knew who Jesus is, but the conscious John had trouble figuring him out. Don't ever let your mind talk you out of your rebel. So the struggle then is when you're seeking it to come into the realization of your perception. God promised it and because God understands the human behavior, he has to motivate us. And the primary motivation that God gives and extends to us is love. But the truth is that faith worketh by love. So faith then becomes the functional, becomes functional because faith is the hypostasis, the substance of things hoped for. It is the elikos or the evidence of things not seen. Uh, the etymologists, uh, Moulton and Mulligan, they say, that faith then becomes a, a deed. It becomes a title deed. And uh, when you study the etymologist to the point, what he's saying is that faith is a title for things that you have not seen. Uh, I buy real estate and I have bought some real estate and I never saw the property. I heard it was a good deal and I bought it. And somebody said, well, have you seen the property? I said, well, I don't really need to see the property because I have the deed. You see, uh, I feel like preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, hold it. I, I broke a fuse. Uh, you see, it was the deed that Caleb had for 40 years. And he held on to the deed because faith is the title deed of what God has promised you. You have the deed in your spirit. And as long as you have the deed in your spirit, the land is already yours. And all God wants you to do is trust him, wait on him, because he knows when to bring it to your sight. Uh, I feel like preaching here. But before he brings it to your sight, he's going to build you in your spirit so that when he releases it, you will have the power to keep it because he has already built you up for the that he's about to give you. Uh, I want you to touch your neighbor. I'm only going to do it seven times. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, the gift is already yours. You ain't ready for it yet. Uh-huh. Just wait, 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 wait. He's building you up to the level of what he's going to release so that when he releases it, you're mature enough to keep it and give him the glory for it. Ah, I feel like shouting here. So then, because of that, there now abideth faith and hope and charity. And if you understand that, then he declares the greatest of these, of course, is charity. Because charity becomes the, sub yeah, the substratum of everything that's going to keep you and hold you together. It's one thing when somebody says, uh, I don't love God, and that's a terrible thing. But it's more terrible when you say God does not love you. You see, it's an awful thing not to love God, but never accuse God of not loving you. 
because the basis of everything that happens within the parameters of the human experience is the love of God. Not the love for God, but the love of God. He watched over you when you didn't love him. He allowed the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So your praise is not because you love God. Your praise should be because he loves you. And when you could bring nothing to the table, ah, nothing to the table, he made an arrangement so that your nothing becomes your contribution. And we call that grace. When you couldn't bring anything to the table, he says, all right, what are you going to bring? Nothing. Okay, I'll make nothing a prerequisite for our relationship. So my strength is made perfect. I wish somebody would give him some praise. It ain't because of you, it's all because of him. And because of this then, he has said to us, and he's shown us, so you all sit down for a minute, uh, uh, that faith and hope hang on love as branches on a tree. Hope seems then to be shrouded into the very base of love and faith. So what hope becomes then is the workhorse of distress. Hope becomes that workhorse of tired patience or tried patience, that expectation. Hope then becomes contradistinctive to apathy. Anytime you're around somebody who says, I don't care, I suggest that you get away from them as quickly as you can because you don't want to be around somebody who has stopped caring. If you understand then the psychology that goes with this theology, then whenever there is no hope, there is apathy. And then wherever there is apathy, then the next step is violence. Oh yes, indeed. When people don't care, they either homicidal or suicidal. And one of the problems then with our world is it leads the majority of the people to a place where they feel hopeless. And when people feel hopeless, they get violent. Ah, oh, stay with me. You see, so hope then is contradistinctive to not caring. And hope is contradistinctive to backsliding. Because whenever I have no expectation, I stop operating within the parameters of my ability. Because it goes like this, no matter what I do, nothing comes to pass. And so if nothing has come to pass, why should I keep doing it? You see, you can't stop me from hoping. I can go into a room and my loved one is awfully sick. And it looks, every time I look at the doctor's face, he has a frown. And it seems to me that he sees that she or he is not going to make it. But you can't stop me from hoping. Uh, I, I hope you're with me. Because if I don't have any expectations, then I can't have faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for. Uh, when I walked into this church today, I didn't walk in with apathy. I walked in because I had an expectation that God is going to bless me. Uh, can I take it from the theology to the, the sociology? I, I'm going to take it to relationship. You see, oftentimes when you have been hurt, you have a penchant to lower your expectation. 
that's why you ought to get over your pain uh, before you try again. Uh -huh. Because many times you go into a new relationship because you figure you, you need to do it for whatever reason, but you haven't gotten over the old relationship. So you're going into the new one and what you do is you lower your expectation. Um, ain't no man good anyway, ain't no good man no way, so uh, I'm going to check him out, but I ain't looking for too much because he ain't on. Now, you're on the side of the table with lowered expectation. I'm on the other side of the table, and what's coming across, because I don't know your history, what's coming across to me is suspicion. So now I came to the table with everything that I had, and I was willing to put it on the table. But all of a sudden, I'm feeling some negative vibes of lower expectation, and then I say, oh, Oh, well, I'm getting some, mm -hmm, some suspicious behavior. So I say, well, maybe I ought to hold on to my stuff until we can check this out. Now, what happens is you end up getting exactly what you expected. Uh -huh. What God is saying is don't approach me like that because I'm not such a one as thyself. If you come to me, don't come to me wondering whether or not I will keep what I said because if I said it, get over the pain and come to me expecting me to deliver what I said. Uh, I feel like having church here. Uh, yeah. uh, can, can, can I preach like I feel it? Now, now, I'm just going to digress for a minute. And let's run to Jesus making a statement that I could not do many mighty works in Nazareth because of their unbelief. Now, I want you to understand this very carefully. It's you not believing God does not limit God from doing what God does. Understand that. So what does he mean when he said, I couldn't do many mighty works? You see, mighty works only become mighty when they're received. Uh, can I put it another way? Paul, uh, Paul Tillich puts it like this. Paul Tillich says, revelation must be given and revelation must be received or it's not revelation. You see, the problem is, in Nazareth, God gave it, but they didn't receive it. So it didn't consummate the relationship. So you see, God has given, but we have lowered our expectation and we have resisted what is already ours. If you expect it, you'll get it. And whatever level you expect, is the level you will get because God has already released it. Everything you will ever get from God has already been released. It's up to you. Uh, I feel like shouting here. Uh, give somebody a high five second time and said, I was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. I was his before I got here. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. It ain't up to God. It's up to me because I have everything that God has given before I even got here. That's why the devil can't stop it because God gave it to me before he created the devil. The devil can't stop it. That's why the devil doesn't mess with my gift. He mess with my character because if he can pollute my character, he can keep me from getting my... Uh, 
I feel a breakthrough coming. I feel it coming. Uh, I'm almost there, Pat. Uh, and so now, hope keeps you calm. And hope stems the violence in us. And this is why the times of waiting on God. And here's what he does now because in the book of Hebrews, he is using admonition. He is using warnings. He is, oh, I mean, he threatens them. He said, oh, it's terrible to fall in the hand of the mighty God. I mean, he just threatens and he encourages and he's, he's gone into his spiritual psychological book and he's trying to get them to understand that you need to stay where you are hold your place don't you go back because everything you're going back to is less than what you have right now uh, can I talk to you for a minute who is it that you feel like you need to go back to after you have met God. When you meet God, uh -huh, everything that kept you down, you ought to get rid of. Uh -huh, because God has something better for you. Who you going back to? Uh, I, I, I'm going to get bogged down there. I'm going to leave that alone. Because God has brought you out of something. And you want to go like a dog back to its vomit? No. What? What? Never again. God has taken you out of a situation. Why are you trying to go back into what God took you out of? I'll starve first. I'll sit over here and wait on God until I starve, but I ain't going back. Because he said, once you take the plow, don't even look back. When God is in your life, you're a movement. When you look back, you become a monument. I ain't trying to be a monument in a moving world where God has taken me higher expect it uh, I'm almost there he tells them now he takes Abraham and he uses Abraham for an example and it's the time now of waiting on God it is now 20 years after the promise and here is Isaac God calls him he is 75 when God calls him and of course his wife is is a beautiful 60 year old and I mean she's fine <laughs> she's so fine at that age until Abraham is worried that everybody's going to grab her and kill him uh, ain't that something uh, you got to understand that age has no set on what God is going to do in your life <laughs> uh, well I'm too old the devil is a lie <laughs> Uh, the same God that promised you when you were young can keep you healthy to enjoy it when you're older. <laughs> I'm a witness. Uh, the promise then was uh, that Abraham was to become the father of many nations. And the promise was that the earth through Abraham was to be blessed. So then God in his greatness has promised Abraham that the world through him would be blessed. Now when is he making the promise? He's making the promise when Abraham is an old man of 75 and his wife 10 years younger is 65. It seems now that God would hurry up and bring this thing to pass. Why? Because God uh, do the math Lord. The man is 75. The wife is 65. What are you going to do? Well God holds back. You see when God gives you the first promise things are difficult he promises you in a 
difficult situation. But because we have a proclivity to take our praise to ourselves, he takes the promise from difficult to impossible. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> you see, anytime you're dealing with God, and the promise he gives you he gives you is difficult and then it moves to impossible then the next step can only be miracle you see he's not going to take it from difficult to miracle he's going to take it from difficult to impossible to miracle so that when he brings it to pass there is no debate as to who did the work. Uh, I feel like preaching here. Uh -huh. Give somebody a high five third time uh, and say, neighbor, what you're going through is you simply waiting for God to do the work. Uh, I will not give my glory to another. Uh -huh. I'm going to bless you, but I want my glory. Uh, Jesus declared that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced which means Abraham had to see Jesus even before he had Isaac are you with me because Isaac now represents the fulfillment of the promise that means then that Abraham would not be around physically to see Jesus so he had to see Jesus in spirit through Isaac so once I know that I have Isaac I know I've got Jesus you see Jesus is the very core of every blessing can I take it further don't you think you're blessed if what you have Jesus isn't in it because if Jesus isn't in it it ain't a blessing uh -huh. don't worry about the size of the blessing because if Jesus is in it the blessing can't be small because you can't have the mighty God in anything that he promised and you walk away from it and say, oh, that ain't much. No, no, no. Jesus is in it if it's a Pinto. Jesus is in it if it's a Rolls Royce. The issue is not whether it's a Rolls Royce or a Pinto. The issue is, is Jesus in it? I'd rather have Jesus in a Pinto than the devil in a Rolls Royce. <laughs> Ah, uh, uh, some pushing me here. And so at best he could only have uh, see Jesus in Isaac. So the writer now says he patiently endured until he obtained the promise. This is his encouragement. But he doesn't stop with encouragement. He has to move now from theology and he bridges into man's yes world. He says now he's trying to convince the individual that I'm going to do what I say. So I'm going to bridge from the theological presentation that may be stressing your intellectual cognitive energy and I'm going to come down to where you are. So what he does now is he illustrates the security of the divine promise by an analogy of human practice. He goes into human practice and here's what he says. He says when anybody makes an oath it stops all the conversation. I said to my daughter I'm going to take you I'm going to take you to Paris and she says well are you really daddy? I said yes. I said well daddy are you really going to do it? Yes. Uh, I said it didn't I? Uh, then two weeks later uh, daddy when are we going to do it? Are you really going to do it? And then I might say something well uh, I cross my heart uh, and I hope to die. And then she says oh 
okay, Daddy, okay. It's going to be all right. What God did was he looked in human practice. And he says, anytime you start making oaths, it stops the debate. Uh, anytime you say to somebody, I, I, on my children's grave, they begin to say, well, he must mean it now because he's calling judgment on his children. So the confident hope then, which God, he now, he now moves to the place where he is saying, you have not taken my word. You have come to church after I've given you a promise and you've sat in the church like a sad sack. You come complaining and you come wondering and you come asking everybody to pray. You know how we do it. We have one prayer partner and if it doesn't come to pass quickly enough, we say, well, she don't have no power. So you get another prayer partner and if it doesn't come to pass, you say, well, he don't have no power. Some people leave their churches because they say, well, my church ain't got no power. My pastor is not close to God. But what they don't realize is the one who gives the promise is the one who operates the timetable of the promise. Nobody can move God quicker than God wants to move. And nobody can stop God from moving when he gets ready to move. So all you got to do when you have expectation is wait on him, but don't wait on him like you're in a raggedy room. Uh, you know, can, can I preach like I feel it? Uh, you see, there's some kinds of waiting. Uh, some of you will sit in a doctor's office with the right kind of blue, and he's playing the melodious, euphonious music that is designed to therapeutically calm your spirit. Uh, and you still impatient uh, with all of that. God has spoken to you over and over and over again. He has shown you testimonies of people who have been blessed and you're still impatient. And you come into church and you can't wait and you come in complaining. When is he going to do it? And when is he, you know, the people are looking at me like I'm crazy. I've told everybody. You, you, know, you know that's a problem when you tell somebody you get married and the man ain't moving and you doing everything to prove to everybody so you showing yourself out you making it look like you with him all the time and he ain't moving but if he made the promise you gotta wait on it you can't make him and he is a mere man you can't make God and let me tell you something sometimes God gets more relationship out of you when you're waiting on him than when you get something. Uh, I feel it. And sometimes he's just sitting there enjoying how you coming to him early in the morning. You never went early in the morning until he made you a promise. Now you're coming early in the morning. You ain't never been to a prayer meeting until you got a promise. Now here you're coming. You're the first one there, you're the last one, you speaking in other tongues and you're getting real close to him and God knows once you get the gift, it's going to be bye bye, see you later uh, so he's enjoying the moment while he's building your character and I got news for you sometimes God delivers the gift when you decide you can live without it uh, uh, go back to Hannah go back to Hannah, when Hannah Hannah decided she'd give it to God. That's when God gave it to her. I don't want to give you a gift that causes you to walk away from me. I want to give you a gift that gets me more praise, gets me more glory, gets me more determination, gets me more work and more faithfulness out of you. Uh, give somebody a high five third time, fourth time, and say, Nay, He's enjoying you right where you are. He's enjoying your praise. He's enjoying you seeking him early. He's enjoying
drawing you, getting other people together to call on his name. I'm almost there. I feel something pushing me now. It's critical now because the Bible says we're in God. In accordance then with the universal custom, God disregards the insult. You insulted me when you wouldn't take my word. You insulted me when you wouldn't believe that I'd do what I said. So the Bible says his willingness and it's not from the word thelo, which is a desire based on emotion, but it's from the word bolomai, which is a desire based on reasoning. In other words, God came by the potter's house and he looked at everybody in the house who was not feeling like he was going to deliver and he said this is not emotional with me I've got to do something for my children I can't allow them just to sit here and act as if I'm not the God that I said I'd be so I'm going to do something that's going to make them understand that the C-O-U-N-C-I-L is the immutable God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the C-O-U-N-C-I-L had a meeting about your life. And they came up with the C-O-U-N-S-E-L and said, I got to talk to these children. I got to show them that the C-O-U-N-S-E-L is as immutable as the C-O-U-N-C-I-L. I, my promise is just immutable as me being God. But I've got to get that child off the bench. I've got to bring that child to the place where they understand that I'm not a turncoat. If I said it, I'll do it. We might as well have church fat. If I said it, I'll bring it to pass because I am not a turncoat. I promised it in eternity and I really didn't promise it. Can I preach like I feel it? I really didn't promise it because I'm omniscient and I am eternal. And what does that say? I already know everything. But when did I know everything? I always knew everything because I am eternal eternal. So as eternal as I am is as eternal as my promise is. And there is no devil that can stop me from bringing it to pass. I just need you to relax. Give somebody a high five for the fifth time and say relax. Just relax because it's coming to pass. Relax because God is getting ready to show his hand. His promise then is from the Greek word a metathaton and that is it's untransposable. I feel like preaching. Can't nobody get what God has promised you. Can't nobody get it. If you see him roll by in a Rolls Royce, that ain't yours. That's his. Yours is on the way. And when you see somebody blessed, you begin to praise God because you just moved up in the line. When somebody's dream has come to pass, you just took another step in the line as long as I'm in the line I can wait on it I feel like lifting him up give some money high five for the second to the last time say I'm in the right line I'm in the praise line. I'm in the holiness line. I'm in the love of God line. I'm in the fasting line. I'm in the line where God operates because I feel his presence. Can I preach like I feel it? Every now and then in the middle of your distress, he comes in the room and gives you a consolation that everything 
everything. It's going to be all right. I think I'll preach the rest of it another time. I feel like lifting him up. But I just come to tell you, where is your anchor? Your anchor is hope. And where is it? It's inside the holy of holies. That's where it's anchored. My hope is anchored in the holy of holies where Jesus has entered. Can no devil get into the holy of holies. So there is no devil that can loose the promise that God has given me because my hope is anchored in the holy of holies. It's behind the veil. Can I get some help? Somebody bring me a mic cord. Bring me a cord. I feel like preaching in here when I felt like walking away my hope I feel like preaching I'm on the top of the water I'm in the middle of a storm the winds are blowing trials are every side but my hope hold on to the other end can I feel like preaching in here I feel like lifting him up. I said, I'm going to walk out the church. I was getting ready to walk out, but my anchor held. I was going to leave. I'm sick and tired of folk talking about me and saying it will not come to pass. I'm leaving, but my held. I said I was going to leave the church and I ain't going back to the house of God. I was walking out oh, and gripped the solid rock. I said I'm going back to the old boyfriend. I'm going back to that old woman. I'm going back to the drugs and the cult. But when I walked out, give some money high five for the last time. Say, neighbor, I can't leave. It's got to come to pass. <laughs> My anchor is I expect it. It's got to come to pass. He said it. I believe it. It's yeah. I still have hope. I still believe God. I still know he'll bring it to pass. Somebody say, it's already done.